Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for this really important conversation. Uh, I will have to say that I'm speaking to you from uh, my Queen's Park office today uh, on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and just want to express uh, the Ontario Green Party's commitment to the truth and reconciliation process and to just express my gratitude for all I've learned from Indigenous peoples about how to protect the land, the water, the creatures, the people that uh, we we all uh, share this land with. And uh, I wanna say that at Queen's Park this week, the housing crisis has really uh, dominated debate. And so the conversation we're having today uh, is happening literally while the uh, government's two housing bills are, are being debated. And so I'm just really honored to be joined by two housing experts to talk about the steps that the province can take uh, to address the housing crisis and address the concerns that so many municipalities, farmers, environmental organizations, community organizations, taxpayer organizations have expressed uh, regarding the current legislation uh, regarding housing that's uh, before the legislature right now. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Sharice Berta, who is the executive director uh, at City Building at Toronto Metropolitan University. Sharice has been a, 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 an advocate for sustainable urban solutions with research collaborations and knowledge mobilization specializing in relevant policy research and strategic communications to drive impact. Uh, she's been the author of over 40 policy reports, book chapters, and academic publications. And for the past 25 years has been a thought leader uh, in a number of roles where she's worked at the Pimmon Institute, uh, has been part of the David Suzuki Foundation, been a senior researcher with the University of Victoria's Ego uh, Research Chair of Environmental Law and Policy. And I'd also like to introduce Mike Moffat. So Mike Moffat is a senior director of policy and innovation at the Smart Prosperity Institute and an assistant professor in the business economics and public policy group at the Ivy Business School at Western University. Mike's research at the Sustainable Prosperity Institute focuses on the intersection of regional economic development, building child-friendly, climate-friendly housing and communities and clean innovation. And outside of his clean economy and housing work that he does for SPI, Mike is a disability rights activist. And I just wanna say for any of you who've spent any time reading media or following social media, you'll know that we have two uh, foremost experts uh, here uh, to be a part of the conversation today. And I just wanna open by saying that, you know, I'm really proud the Ontario Greens have put forward a, a plan over a year and a half ago that some have called uh, a masterclass in delivering the solutions Ontario needs to address the housing crisis. Uh, and to do it in a way that we can avoid opening the green belt for development, paying over, paving over the farmland that feeds us, the wetlands and nature that clean our drinking water and protect us from flooding. And I put forward two private members bills this week, uh, Bill 44 and 45, which um, address ways in which we can increase housing supply uh, without having to sprawl. And I uh, look forward to uh, being able to debate those at Queen's Park. But in the meantime, I really wanna focus on Bill 23 and Bill 39, uh, which are the two uh, housing uh, bills that are before the legislature right now. And I wanna open uh, with a question to both Patrice and Mike, and maybe Patrice, if you can start. Um, Bill 23 is literally being debated in the house right now. Um, it's likely going to be voted on uh, on Monday, and um, I'm just wondering if you could just open up what what are, what are, from your perspective are some of the consequences um, that Bill uh, 23 and let's also say Bill 39 um, uh, will have on addressing uh, the the housing crisis and 
what do you think are the effects of the corresponding reg regulations associated with with the bill, especially when it comes to um, environmental concerns, but also housing affordability concerns? Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot for um, inviting me to be part of this. It's been um, a big, it's been like a thesis trying to understand this bill and decode it. Um, and there's not enough time to go through it all in detail because there's so much in there. Um, there's some good things in the bill, but there's a lot of bad things. And I'll just like paint an overarching picture, which is, you know, back when we had the task force, um, I don't remember when that was last year, the uh, Housing Affordability Task Force. The, the word affordability and um, affordable appeared um, about 114 times in that document. Now the word affordability has all but vanished from every piece of legislation, communication, everything that has moved forward with this government. Um, the, the build homes faster has nothing to do about affordability. The term attainability, um, has appeared, um, you know, instead. And so I believe that there's a bit, there's been a strategic approach to, in some ways, um, you know, co-opt the housing affordability crisis and repurpose it as just a housing crisis and use that crisis to, um, kind of a la carte choose the types of um, development that are going to suit specific developers and friends of the Ford government rather than addressing the issue, which is housing affordability. So I'll just start there. Um, do you want me to go into the details of the bill? Have I already used up too much airtime? No, oh, go ahead. I, I, I cede the floor. So <laughs> please. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, details. for sure. So um, I will start with the good stuff, which is the exclusionary zoning in um, in our yellow belt and our missing middle. And there's so much to say on that, but I'm going to save that for later when we talk about solutions. And I think that we can achieve so much good housing supply and so much affordable housing supply by working with our already urbanized footprint and working in ways that we aren't just building tall condos or tall buildings with small condos, which aren't gonna suit people. Because I think that with the bill, the bill really forces um, us, it, it forces to build more tall and sprawl. Um, and we can get into some of the, the, the negatives of sprawl, um, but if we are only building um, mostly tall condo buildings with um, small units, in effect, we aren't building suitable housing. And what that does is it pushes people out to sprawl. Unless we build the type of family-friendly housing within our urbanized areas, then we're essentially building stuff that people can't live, like all people can't live in. So if we're, if we're using our precious resources like labor and construction and um, you know, our infrastructure to build the wrong supply in our footprint, then we're pushing people out to sprawl. Right. So, um, but if I if I could just quickly, I'll just quickly whiz through some of the things um, with the bill. Um, you know, we could talk about the the um, erosion of the conservation authority, which was brought in when we had Hurricane Hazel, and it's like we need flood protection, folks. So let's get these places in motion and protect areas. And without that gone, like we're in a climate crisis, we're in a climate emergency, this is not the time to be rolling back on that stuff. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of other um, challenges to municipal um, revenue, which is necessary to pay for the infrastructure to service by, by reducing um, development fees, reducing parkland, which means that our um, you know, ever growing towers are gonna become unlivable. Um, reducing or eliminating site level planning where we can put in our green standards and put in our architectural standards to make sustainable buildings, to make livable communities. Um, that's not going to help us with community building. Um, and then there's a real, um, I think, erosion of affordability. So the irony is we've lost affordability. We're, the word affordability, and then we're losing affordability in terms of this bill. Um, 
the cap on inclusionary zoning has been lowered, um, which isn't going to translate into more affordability. And I would say also that um, the, the, the rental replacement bylaws um, by um, getting rid of those is a real challenge and a real affront on affordability. We need all the affordable housing that we can get. Those old buildings are under rent control. And by saying, oh, let's just replace them with condos that won't be under rent control, even if they are rental, um, we are losing affordable rental in those ways. There's a bunch of other things that um, that exist as well, but I've taken up too much time. It's a long bill. It is a long bill. It is a very long bill, Therese. And, uh, and you're right, it's being rammed through the house so quickly. And even the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and former mayors have been denied opportunity to even speak to the bill at committee. And I can tell you a number of municipalities have passed resolutions either against the bill or saying, at least give us time to properly analyze its implications. Um, but unfortunately, that, that's not happening. So, Mike, I'm just going to say, you know, Civil yeah. Prosperity Institute yeah. in general, you in particular, you've crunched a lot of numbers yeah. on housing supply and affordable housing supply. And um, do you think uh, Bill 23 and then Bill 39, which is also, um, which is the bill that sort of puts strong mayors on steroids and breaks <laughs> minority rule, um, do you think they're actually going to provide the affordable housing supply we need? No, I, I, I certainly, I, I certainly don't. Um, we, you know, one of the things I know, you know, despite the fact that this bill is the size of a New York City phone book, that's kind of dated reference, there's nothing in here. There's, there's no key performance indicators when it comes to how many houses are actually going to get built in the next couple of years. How affordable are they? You know, Sharice points out that, you know, that the term has been eliminated entirely. And if we look at the government's own fall economic statement, they have uh, some forecasts in there on housing starts. And the government itself is showing housing starts to fall over the next couple of years, be weak through 2025. So it's hard to see by, by the government's kind of own estimates. You know, they're saying that, that you know, they're not seeing a lot of housing starts happening over the next three years. So there's some disconnect there. And it, it's hard to even see what the sort of theory of change is, like where you would get all of the sort of housing. Like, you know, we've opened up the, these portions of the green belts uh, to build a bunch of McMansions, right? So it's not a very, um, you know, the environmental part aside, just the, the sort of density side, you're not going to get that many units in that area. And in the long run, it may end up actually costing you housing because, because of that flood risk. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, and that's going to be ultimately paid for by the taxpayer, that if we're getting all of the these houses uh, and these communities and these neighborhoods um, that have to get bailed out, Ultimately, it's all of us going to be paying for that. So we look at, you know, I think there are very real concerns about what does this mean for municipal tax revenue, but I also, you know, starting to think, okay, well, what does this mean for federal and provincial budgets in future years because of climate risk? The uh, Parliamentary uh, Budget Office and uh, the, the the FAO in Ontario reported this, that, you know, we've got, you know, billions of dollars of uninsured liabilities when it comes to uh, flood and fire risk for housing. And this is only going to increase that. Yeah, and no, those are really good points. I, I want to get back to actually, maybe I'll follow up with you on that, Mike, is I know SPI has been doing uh, some research, and I've seen a bit of an infographic you put out on yeah. social media, the cost of servicing, yeah. you know, a, a, a home in a more urban environment versus the cost of servicing a home uh, suburban sprawl. And I'm just wondering if maybe you could give us some of those numbers and just give us a bit more detail on the, the financial implications of sprawl. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a little humbling. This is something we put out 11 years ago, and it's still the most uh, widely circulated thing that we've, we've ever done. We've never been able to beat this thing. But absolutely, when you look at the cost of providing uh, municipal services and mun municipal infrastructure, whether it be roads, you know, if you're building out sprawl, you're having to build out more roads. Uh, you're having to have more fire stations and police stations because, you know, you're getting you're further away from a fire and 
you don't you don't want to be too far away from a police station or fire station so the, the more you sprawl out the more of these things you have to build you end up building a lot of little little libraries instead of some some larger central ones so we've crunched the numbers and we found that sort of annually per year like annually uh that the the cost of providing all those services is about two to three times higher on the outskirts of a city as it is downtown so you're you know if you're looking at uh a, a cost per household of say fifteen hundred dollars downtown you'd be looking at about 4500 down the suburb so absolutely that the, the the way that this uh bill sort of encourages sprawl puts those costs onto the municipal government and ultimately municipal taxpayers yeah and, and Sharice, i wanted to um just elaborate a bit more you you'd brought up the fact that the government is once again weakening conservation authorities i <laughs> thought they'd weakened them so much in the past that they couldn't do it anymore but they figured out a way to do that um and just sort of environmental protections in yeah. general this is associated with the regulations around the premier breaking his promise not to develop the green belt and i'm just wondering if you could any you made a reference to Hurricane Hazel and 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 why we strengthen conservation authorities in the first place. So maybe just elaborate a bit more on, you know, the environmental implications of sprawl in general and this bill in particular. Yeah, again, um, we like, for example, like I really I really love um, Mike's um, um, factoid about mm -hmm. how much more it costs, um, you know, in terms of money. Um, to sprawl there's also like big costs for um for the environment as well like climate like another great fun fact is that the like a downtown camp like in like a city um an urban area um that's compact um has half the ghg emissions yeah. in the national average right um, but if the suburban fringe has twice as many GHG emissions as the national average. So, and that's that's for many reasons, but it's also, you know, largely due to car dependency, right? Mm -hmm. And when you continue to build out these new subdivisions on farmers fields, um, you're gonna have to service it all, as Mike says, with the infrastructure, which costs money, but then everything's car dependent. And then, mm -hmm. then that blows up, you know, meeting our car, our, our climate targets. But the other thing I want to add is, um, you know, we often think about climate change, but we also need to think about food security. And, you know, certainly in the face of climate change, we've all seen this in just in the past year, how um, like some of our supply chains and our food imports have been at risk because food producing regions in Western Canada or California are facing droughts or facing fires or things with they can't like our food security or being able to rely on importing food is becoming, you know, not a given anymore. And we have so much, our, our prime agricultural land, guess what, is in the Greenbelt and around the Greenbelt and the Greater Golden Horseshoe. That is the prime agricultural land left in Ontario. We used to have more of it, but we paved over it. We built houses and big box stores. We don't have much farmland left. We need to protect our food security. We know our population is going to be growing. And yes, we need to house them in a thoughtful way. We also need to feed that population. And if we don't protect our local food, we are putting our food security at, work, at risk. We are putting our drinking water headlands mm -hmm. at risk. And we need to be growing the green belt, not shrinking it. And the, you know, the province's land swap and um, you know, shell game, you know, is like. It, nobody's buying it. It's it's like those are cherry picked areas that belong by that uh, are held by um, wealthy speculators who have been frustrated having their lands. These lands are just bought them and they're locked up in the green belt and swapping them for lands of lesser farm value or 
for lands that are already quasi protected by, you know, being in river valleys, for example, like we can't start picking away at the green belt or else it just, you know, starts to lose its integrity and other developers are going to want in. So there is so much, there's like, it's not just a, a, a conservation area where people go to recreate, right? It is where our food is produced. And as we move forward into climate change and our, our weather's changing here too, um, putting pressures on our food producing areas, we need to protect those areas um, as much as we can. Yeah, Trish, I wanna follow up with you on a comment you made about one of the good things in the bill is, is and I would ar argue from my perspective, it's tiptoeing into ending exclusionary zoning by bringing in triplexes and in debate in the house, I've, you know, said, yeah, that's a small step in the right direction. I'll just say I introduced a bill this week that would allow fourplexes and walk up four story apartments as of right, which I think is yeah. probably as far further and where the government needs to go. But I, but I preface that by saying like, so you talked about exclusionary zoning and, and, and why is it important uh, to end exclusionary zoning? And what are the implications in terms of kind of where we actually build homes uh, by by moving forward with that kind of policy. Yeah, and if the audience isn't familiar with the term, if you can think about all of our residential areas that are dominated by single family homes, um, the zoning um, has, you know, currently prevented anything larger from being built in those areas. Um, it didn't always, there was a time where small apartment buildings were allowed in our residential areas, and those are kind of like grandfathered in, but to end this zoning would mean that we can open up just our, you know, if we, if we look at our city, if we look at most cities, we see really like tall towers and density and, and small nodes of, of, of high density, and then everything else kind of flat, right? I'm not talking about suburban sprawl. I'm talking about just even in, in cities, a lot of single family homes. And we can very thoughtfully add density to those residential neighborhoods. If you think about the single family homes, we can add units to those homes. There's already um, lots of homes that have um, more than one unit in them. They, they're, they're commonly rental. And we can add laneway houses and garden suites. And then on the main streets, we can start to get a little bit higher with townhouses and with walk-up buildings. So there's a lot of, den you can actually, because yeah. these residential areas, are the majority of our land base. You can add um, density and meet our population requirements um, with that, as well as um, building out our, um, you know, redeveloping our plazas, doing our main streets, doing our transit areas. But the, 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 the reason why this residential area is so important to get right is because that offers a family friendly options for our already built up urban footprint. Like, yes, we can build those condos, but we need the family friendly stuff too. And the other thing that's really important about it is from a carbon perspective, when you are building out into sprawl, as we've talked about here, you can make use of existing infrastructure. So all the things Mike talked about, whether it's libraries or schools or sewer pipes, all those things already exist, our transit, they're already transit. And it's like, you're not going to um, you know, exceed the capacity for these areas to accommodate more population. We actually need more population because the population in most of these residential areas are declining. Yeah, Mike, I, I related to, to the point Sharice just made is um, in debate in the house, literally this morning I was debating bill 23 in the house and the questions and pushback I was getting from the government members was that um, we have to build 1.5 million homes. There's no way we're going to do it if we don't open the green belt for development. If we don't, um, you know, allow these types of suburban subdivisions to go forward. Um, and I would say if there's any institute out there, SPI has probably crunched the numbers on 1.5 million and sort of what it's going to take to get yeah. there. And so I'm curious, like, do you think sprawl development is going to get us to the 1.5 million homes we need? Or do you think there's, you know, other ways or, or is there other no. ways we're going to have to do it to be able to get the numbers we need, but also do it in a way that's actually affordable? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's literally the the least efficient, you know, most labor intensive, most land intensive way uh, way to get there. So so no, I I, I don't think it is. And uh, furthermore, you know, if we go back to the, the the task force that we mentioned earlier, they were explicit in that that you do not need to touch the green belt and that that would not help the situation so you know you can believe it uh, you can believe it from Cherise, you can believe it from the smart prosperity institute or you could believe it from ford's own task force and you know if the ford government is looking for ideas i think it could adopt many of the ideas that were in the task force report that they've punted on uh one of them as, as you mentioned was being able to build four plexes up to four stories um, that was in the, the task force report. It's been it's been ignored. You know, build, building more density along transit lines, things like that. You know, we spend so much money on on transit, and that's a very good thing. You know that that we do have that transit, and then we don't build up enough density along those lines to you know be able to to run the trains all the time and and to make it economically viable. So it's just having housing work together with, with transit, work together with uh, with land use to make sure uh, that that we can grow our own food and, and that our water stays clean. So it's just bringing all these pieces together. And I think, you know, the, the thing that they need to do is implement the recommendations of the, of the task force report, which gets you about 70% of the way there. The one thing that the task force report really didn't look at is the the sort of uh, sub market uh, side, you know, so looking at um, affordable housing, you know, there are some things in the task force report, but it's pretty light, but implement the task force report then look to see what you could do on on non-market housing and other forms of housing because there's just there's components that the market will never be able to build at a price that that is is affordable yeah can i can i build on that i think that's a really important yep. point and um you know hearkening back to your earlier comment about the mcmansions and the green belt is going to do nothing for affordability I would say that most of the supply that's going to be built through Bill 23 will do nothing for affordability. And um, I really think that we can, you know, the the market has gotten us into this mess. Um, we can't we can't rely on the market to solve it. It's not that simple. We need um, a number of different approaches. And this goes back to the point that this was an affordable housing crisis. We need to put affordable back into the crisis. And if you do that, then you start prioritizing projects and policies and programs that are going to achieve affordability. I mean, we don't have time to run through them all right now, but I would say starting with um, social housing. We have a 12-year waiting list in, in Toronto for social housing. And it's simply because we stopped investing. Like as simple as that. Um, you know, a, a place like Finland um, allocates a percentage of the GDP every year to um, social housing, to um, to affordable housing, and they don't have a housing problem. They don't have a homeless problem like we do. We need to allocate that money and start building and start catching up. I would also say that we have significantly relied on private market rental, which are all those old um, um, apartment buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s. We see those all over the place. Like they're in, a lot of them are in the suburbs like Etobicoke and, 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 and Scarborough. They're, they're older, right? They're about 20 stories, those old slab apartment buildings. Those were originally built as luxury rentals back in the 60s. You should have seen the marketing on that. It was yeah. like, live on, look over the park, it's great. You know, that's an example of where filtering or the trickle down from building a lot of supply made its way to affordability, but it's the only example of trickle down or filter. It's only, exa it's only example where you build a whole bunch of a supply and it translates into affordability, but it took two to three decades to do that. And I'll tell you what else um, made those those house that housing affordable was rent control. Those all those apartment buildings had rent control, and all of those apartment buildings had vacancy control, which means that the unit itself is under rent control. And and so what's happening with those our old affordable pri private rental buildings that took two to three decades 
to translate from market rate to more affordable, we're losing them. We're losing them right now. Like we need to double down on saving the affordable stock that we have. We're losing them for two things. They're being demolished and replaced with expensive condos, which won't be under rent control. And then they're also being financialized and renovated and um, you know, um, with private ass uh, asset firms and, and turning into more expensive units. So we need to really think about how our funding and financing is being and budgets are being allocated because if we don't focus on this like part of the housing spectrum, this is why we have an affordability crisis. Just by building, if we don't build like a certain percentage of those 1.5 million homes or how many homes we're going to get built as affordable, we're still going to have a crisis. That's not going to go away. So, and it's going to take a long time for the filtering to translate, especially if we don't have rent control, it won't translate into affordability. And um, so I, I really think that there's a lot we need to do. And I'll say one more thing and I've said enough, but it's um, going back to the missing middle and those really like, I would say subtle renovations that can be done really, really cheap, like adding a unit to a house, adding a laneway suite, like those things are small scale, right? A lot of it makes use of an existing home. And that can be done so much more cost effectively. I've been crunching the numbers in terms of what it costs to build an affordable housing unit. And this isn't even social housing. This isn't even deep affordability. This is 80% market rate. These homes cost about a six, 600 to 800,000 to build them, whether it's done in a, um, a, 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 a apartment building that is constructed for affordable housing or whether it's um, you know, units in inclusionary zoning. That's how much it costs to deliver those. Like we are never going to reach what we need. But if you could imagine these small scale renovations happening in our residential areas that could cost maybe 30 to $50,000 to do with local labor, take the developer out of it, work with the homeowner, give them tax credits. Don't ask them to go through a whole onerous process of like re, re, <laughs> rebuilding their home. We have a municipal program that has simplified plans that are already approved, work with all the things that are gonna say no, like building code and bylaws, get it all ready to go, have a revolving fund program. Uh, we were talking about Mike with a local improvement charges, ways to make it work for the homeowner so that they deliver at least one affordable unit and the national housing strategy needs to step in and help to fund and finance this because they're, they're not putting their money into anything that is translating into affordable housing right now and we need to do and that is one solution that could totally work if i give a quick example i kitchener's been doing a lot of like making making zoning changes to make that easier i toured a a uh, house where somebody took a just single family home, divided it into two residents and built a tiny home on the same property. Three families now are inhabiting the same space, one family inhabited, and they did it for less than $100,000. Like it's, it's amazing what, what could be done quickly and, and affordably. Before we that. run out of, and also just want to say really quick, the Canadian Co-op Federation was at Queens Park this week and they've, put forward, I think, some really sound proposals around building 100,000 uh, co-op housing homes uh, over the next decade that would be both market rate and deeply affordable. And so there are a lot of solutions out there if we're, we're willing to invest in those kinds of solutions in the case of co-ops like we did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Before we run out, wanna, before we run out of time, Mike, I just wanted to ask you a bit about financial implications of Bill 23 for municipalities, uh, because I know that the changes in development charges in particular ha has a number of municipalities saying this is gonna blow a hole in their budgets. And in the case of the city of Toronto, saying that the money we were actually saving to build some deeply affordable social housing is, is now gonna be lost because of some of the changes um, uh, in Bill 23. And so I'm just wondering if you've, 
you know, crunched any numbers or have any thoughts around the financial implications of the bill for municipal governments? Yeah. Um, so I mean, not personally, I've, I've looked over the ones that the municipal governments have sent. And I think that they're pretty accurate. You know, we're, we're looking across the province at hundreds of millions of dollars. And you're absolutely right that that needs to come from somewhere. And the, the cruel irony of that is it's probably going to come from affordable uh, affordable home type uh, programs uh, because it usually usually comes out of a sort of big pool of sort of housing money. So it it is a it is a big, big problem. You know, I do think there are there does need to be reforms to development charges. You know, go back to that sort of cost to sprawl thing. It's it, it would be more expensive for me to take my existing home and convert it into a triplex than it would be to build uh, two McMansions on the outskirts of my city um, in, in development charges, you know, and that's sort of a problem, right? The development charges are supposed to pay for the cost of development, but, you know, oftentimes they're too rich in, you know, too, you know, overly high in existing neighborhoods and don't pay for the cost of sprawl and sprawling. So we certainly need development charge reform, but, you know, what, what this does is just lower it in certain parts with no sort of offsetting move somewhere else. It just downloads all of these responsibilities or all these costs onto the municipality at a time where municipalities are already facing a, a cash crunch because of uh, the, the tax base eroding uh, from commercial and industrial, particularly uh, commercial and office rentals. So you have all of these vacancies. Um, so the commercial and office uh, market is not great. So that's affecting the tax base. So you have to sort of make that up somewhere. And now you have this additional pressure. So, you know, municipalities are right to be concerned. And I'm not surprised that they're, you know, screaming from the rooftops about what this is going to mean for their budgets. Yeah, I would add to that and say, you know, also, I don't think municipalities want to throw it on the property taxpayers, right? Like, that's, right. that's the one trough we can go to in municipalities. And I think that, like Mike's point is so important how growth should pay for growth yep. and that there are ways that we can stay like, like kind of cash flow, like achieve the same revenue that municipalities have been getting from differential um, development charges where, where we're actually charging more for sprawl and charging less with the type of um, developments that we want, like affordable housing, right? So it like just using it as a blunt interest instrument and then reducing it doesn't help us with our city building goals. Like we have to make that, we have to harness those types of policies to achieve the types of cities we want to live in. So I know we need to wrap up and oh my gosh, I, I could continue this conversation probably for a good another hour, but I know both of you have incredibly uh, busy schedules and and um, MPPs have a lot, little few things to do as well. So I, I want to wrap it up, but I want to give each of you an opportunity to just, uh, you know, before Bill 23 is voted on likely Monday, um, if, if you had any thoughts on, uh, like, I don't know, maybe a message to MPPs like myself and others um, of like, you know, and what's wrong with Bill 23 from your perspective? And alternatively, what could we do to actually address the housing affordability crisis? Maybe just your elevator pitch on, on those two. And um, Sharice, why don't we start with you and let Mike close? How's that? Okay, I'll be super quick. Um, I'll go back to my mantra, which is put affordability back in the housing crisis look at it through that lens and bring in the climate crisis. And if we do everything from those two lenses, we will figure out what parts of Bill 23. Um, I would also add livability, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I do think that livability translates into people like choosing their homes with their feet, right? If they end up in sprawl, like I was saying, it's because we're not building livable neighborhoods in the places that are already urbanized. So I think we need to look at everything from um, you know, I'm going to expand the lens. Sorry, I'm going at it. Um, okay. Affordability, equity, um, you know, climate slash sustainability and livability. Like, look at it from that lens. Build the cities that we want. And the parts of Bill 23 that don't make sense shouldn't be done. 
And we have an opportunity to use development charges and those types of fees to build the types of cities that we want. And we um, also need to look at the fact that there is already enough land in our urban footprint and also in our green fields that have been allocated for housing that um, has been approved, but they, they, but for a myriad of reasons, it hasn't been developed. And those reasons are everything from challenges with servicing the land to all the way to speculation. Like, so there, we don't need the green belt. There's enough land. Um, we're not bumping against the green belt. And I just want to make that clear. Great. And, and Mike, from your perspective? Yeah, well, I think ultimately a housing bill should be about housing. And these bills are big omnibus bills. And there's a lot in there that really have nothing to do with housing. You know, the the, the relative powers of mayors versus councillors, the, the, re the relative powers of regional governments versus the the uh, lower tier municipalities, which is something we haven't talked about. Right. Um, the uh, The role of conservation authorities. You know, deal. Look at all of those. Those aren't housing priorities. Instead, you know, focus on the housing side. You have a task force which is given a very good blueprint. It's not going to get us all of the way there, but it does a very good job. So go back to the drawing board, use the blueprint that we already have, and build that instead of creating this new thing which changes dozens of acts all over the place, most of which have little to, to nothing to do with housing in the first place. So maybe maybe if I could sum up what you both said, keep your promise not to develop the green belt and actually follow some of the recommendations <laughs> of your housing affordability task force, which you handpicked. Maybe that's the the summation then. <laughs> well, well, that's I mean that's that's the irony of this. It's their task force. Uh, you know, they they also said there was going to be this this implementation force with the mayor of Windsor and the the mayor of Hornpain. Right. They haven't even completed their job yet, but we're doing all of this stuff anyway. So the sequencing here just doesn't make sense. Where we we have a task force, then we have an implementation task force that hasn't even met yet. And then we have a bill that doesn't really address the recommendations made from the task force. So there's just this massive disconnect. So I say, just go back and do the things you promised to do. Don't do and don't do the things you promised not to do. And then you have you 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 have a you, you have a roadmap to success. And I just I don't understand what they're doing here. Well, you know what? I really appreciate the two of you taking the time today to. Lynn, a nonpartisan expert uh, analysis of what we can do to address the housing affordability crisis and, you know, the implications of Bill 23 and 39, which are before the legislature right now. And uh, I just want to say, because I know there are, are a number of people um, out there organizing right now, especially uh, folks who are, uh, you know, really mobilizing to tell the premier to keep his promise, not develop the green belt. Um, I hope any of you who've had an opportunity to, to just listen in today, hopefully you've uh, achieved some information that when you're going out and talking to your neighbors and knocking on doors and sign waving and things like that, that you can let people know what some of the problems with these bills, but also what some of the solutions are. And uh, I would I would just say also, you know, I would encourage folks to follow both Sharice and Mike on their social media accounts and through their websites. Uh, because chock full of information and information that really is inform the, the work I do here at Queens Park. So I want to thank both of you for, for joining us today and, and for all the great work you do each and every day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.